from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Pilate asked the question, what is truth? And truth, not facts, are what we're talking about tonight, and there's a difference. Facts are not necessarily the truth. They're the best we know at the time. But today's newspapers, I mean this day's newspapers, reported that public confidence in the leadership of our major institutions, such as the media, education, banking, government, the military, medicine, business, has sunk to the lowest in at least a decade. And every institution today is under attack in our country, the home, church, the government, and many people are asking what is the truth. They're asking what is the truth about the airliner that was downed off the coast of Japan. And inside the pages of the Bible are stories of lust and hate and war and crime as bad as anything that we read in history. It's called the Holy Bible. It's holy because it tells the truth. It tells the truth about God about man, about the devil. But Satan has caused a credibility gap to be established. Our magazines are filled with stories of Satan worship. Satan has his disciples, demons, sorcery, witchcraft, and wizards are front page news today. And the devil and his legions seem to be gathering steam for the last great conquest of this earth. Now, Jesus wasn't afraid to call him what he was. Jesus called him a liar and the father of lies. He said, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. In the Garden of Eden, God had said, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. If you eat of that particular tree, all the fruit in the garden is yours, except that one tree. God was testing man. The devil came along. He was in the garden. How did the devil get here? Read the 14th chapter of Isaiah, the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, and you'll get some hints and ideas as to how Satan came to this planet. He was probably the finest and the most gorgeous of all the created beings of God. And one day his heart was lifted with pride, and he decided he wanted to be greater than God. So he led a rebellion against God. Now, we don't know how that happened. That's a mystery beyond our comprehension. There's no use really spending any time on it because we just don't know. But, he, but we do know what he said to Eve. He said, yea, hath God said? He was putting doubt in her mind about the word of God. Just as the devil is still putting doubts concerning the inspiration of scriptures. Are the scriptures authoritative? Are they infallible? Yea, have God said. And then ye shall not die. That was the next thing she said, universalism. Everybody will be saved eventually. And then you will be as God. That's what the secularist and the humanist are saying. We're our own God. Now, the first time that man had to make a choice between God's truth and the devil's lie, he chose the devil's lie. And when Adam and Eve rejected God's truth and accepted the devil's lie, that was the moment that all the troubles of the whole world began. Our sinful nation, nature, often sides with the devil's lie instead of God's truth. Because you see, we are now sinners. We're crippled, crippled for life. And we side with the lie. We'd rather believe the devil's lie than God's truth. And a child can lie before it can talk. It can steal before it can walk. Ask your child before he can talk or walk, did you take your sister's doll? And he, being unable to talk, shakes his head no. He lied before he could talk. And he stole before he could walk. Now, where did he learn to lie? The disease is inherited, like other inherited diseases. You see, we inherit it from our parents, and they inherited it, inherited it from their parents on back to Adam and Eve. It's a disease that is all through the whole human race. No group of people in the world are exempted from the disease of sin. 
and it's the disease of sin that is at the heart of the troubles of the world at this moment. Sin is taking sides with the lie. Now, the Bible speaking of the Antichrist says in 2 Thessalonians 2, this lawless man is produced by the spirit of evil and armed with all the force wonders and signs and falsehood can devise. To those involved in this dying world, he will come with evil's undiluted power to deceive, for they have refused the love of truth, which could have saved them. God sends upon them, therefore, the full force of evil's delusion, so that they put their faith in an utter fraud and meet the inevitable judgment of all who have refused to believe the truth and who have made evil their playfellow. And God also says in Romans 1, these men deliberately forfeited the truth of God and accepted a lie. God, therefore, handed them over to disgraceful passions. They see truth as a lie and a lie is the truth. And they make money, power, sex experience, and other things their gold and their gods. And they accept the lies of the devil. And many young people that are here tonight are accepting now the whispers of Satan in your ear. Come down this path. Take this drug. Sleep with this girl. Do this, do that. And you'll find pleasure and happiness. That's the way you ought to live. And then there's religious hypocrisy that brings no lasting peace. Millions of young people go to church without having a personal relationship with Christ. I remember I used to be taken to church by my parents, and I hated church. They made me go to church, and I had to sit there, and my cousins and I sometimes could slip away and crawl under the seats, or we could make little paper airplanes and fling them. And my father would always see it, and he would say, I'll see you when we get home. And he never forgot, never forgot. And I got a many a whipping because of what I did in church. And I couldn't wait to grow up and go away from home so I wouldn't have to go to church. But then when I was about 16 or 17, I received Christ as my Savior. And I went back to church, and the next Sunday I told my parents, I said, you know, Dr. Lindsay certainly is preaching a wonderful sermon. He's learned something from this evangelistic campaign in our city. And they said, no, he's preaching the same type of sermons, but you're just listening with different ears. And I was. And I began to make notes on the sermons I was hearing. Come to Christ. It's so easy to be in the church. Well, they even elected me the president of the young people's class, and they elected me the treasurer even. And uh, I was uh, looked upon as a good person. And they didn't know that I was rejecting Christ all the time and rejecting the teachings of the church and couldn't wait to get away. I was a hypocrite. Now there's another delusion that's going around among young people, and that is that peace is just around the corner. It is not. There will not be any peace in the world until the Prince of Peace is taken into account and the Prince of Peace comes. But we find deception, delusion, and the practicing of the lie on every hand. The credibility gap is seen everywhere. What is the answer? What can young people do? Turn to Christ. Turn to the truth. He said, my truth will set you free from the bondage and shackles of sin. And you that are watching by television, pick up the phone and call that number that's on the screen right now. Their counsel is standing by. They'll be happy to talk to you. And if you first you call and it's busy, call again. Call several times. They'll be there all evening to help you in your Christian life or to find Christ right now. There are many of you with problems in the home or problems with drugs or alcohol or whatever. Call and talk to that counselor now. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. He is the truth. He said, I am the truth. I'm the embodiment of all truth. It's in me. You come to Jesus Christ and he's the truth. He's not the lie. And he tells the truth. Jesus did not say, ye shall know a truth or any truth, but the truth. There are usually truths in every religion and every philosophy. But he's the embodiment of all truth. The scripture says, 
about Jesus Christ that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is the truth I'm asking you to receive and believe tonight instead of the devil's lies. Jesus said, if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. If you don't believe that and don't accept that and know Christ, you're going to die in your sins and you'll be lost. Jesus Christ claimed to be ultimate truth. Are you willing to face the truth? Jesus Christ told the truth about everything. He told the truth about sin. He said, for within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts and adulteries and all the other sins that we commit. It's out of the heart. War comes from the human heart. Family tensions and problems come from the human heart. Rebellion comes from the human heart. We are that way by nature. He told the truth about love. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. You say, Billy, how, do you, how could God love me? You don't know what I've done. You don't know what a big hypocrite I've been. I don't have to know. I just know that whatever you've done, whatever you are now, God loves you. And he loves you with a love that you don't even know anything about because there is no human love comparable to divine love. God's love sent his son to the cross to die and shed his blood for you. And he would have died had you been the only person in the whole world. He loves you. Don't ever forget he loves, 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 loves you. And he sees you sitting there. And when he was on the cross because he was God, he had the capacity to look down these 20 centuries and see you and say, for you, Jim, I'm hanging on this cross. And there is being put on me right now your sins. You've told lies, Jim or Mary, or Susie, or whatever your name is. You've committed immorality. You've stolen. You've been a big hypocrite. You've listened to the devil. You've done all those things. Well, let me tell you, Jim, Mary, Susie, your sins right now are being put on me. I'm dying for you. I'm taking your judgment and your hell on me now. And I'm going to stay on this cross. I could come down, and you could go to hell but I love you too much. I'm going to stay here and die for you. And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did. And God raised him from the dead, and he's alive. And so I do not preach to you a dead Christ hanging on a cross. I preach to you a risen Christ who's alive tonight and who is coming back. Yes, God so loved. And then he told the truth about judgment. Jesus warned people to flee the wrath of God. Yes, God is angry with the wicked every day. God has anger, and that anger is going to explode into the judgment. Jesus said every idle word that men speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. Every idle word, all your thoughts, all your words, everything you've ever done will be at the judgment and you will be condemned by your own words. He said, except you repent, you shall perish. Now that's truth. Unless you repent, unless you, Mary, Bill, Susie, unless you repent, you're going to perish. What is repentance? Have you repented? Are you sure of it? I was a good boy in church. I'd never repented. I might have said something to the elders when they met with me to see if I was okay to join the church at 12. I didn't know what they were even talking about. I'd memorized the catechism. I couldn't understand it. It was just some memory of things for me. I hadn't really repented because repentance means that I change. I change my mind about God, about myself, about my fellow man. I change my way of living. 
But you know, I don't have any strength to change. I can't really change. I can't really become a Christian. Why? Because I'm dead in trespasses and in sins. God has to help me change. He has to help me repent. And I say, oh God, help me to repent. And then the second thing, not only do you have to repent, but by faith you must receive Christ into your heart as Savior and Lord. And Jesus told the truth about conversion. He said, he indicated you cannot be born into the Christian faith. You have to be born from above, born again. And the process is called conversion, which includes faith. And Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's not telling the ad, he's not telling people to become like adults. He's telling us to become like little children and have childlike faith. Some people try to enter the kingdom of God head first. They want to understand it. But you can never understand it all. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand. You come by simple faith like a little child trusts its mother and its father. And you put your total confidence in Jesus Christ by faith. Have you done that? Repent, receive by faith, and then obey him, live the life, follow him, serve him, whatever the cost. And it's costly. Let's face it, in the world in which we live, if you hold on to Christian values and you live up to moral standards laid down by Christ, it's going to cost you. It'll cost you some friends. It'll cost you some money. It'll cost you a lot of things and certain pleasures of the world. It'll cost us. And sometimes I have a hard time deciding on some things. Whether I should have this or have that, whether I should go there or go here. Because we live in a confused world. Satan has confused us. And no longer do we even hear many sermons on being separated from the world. What does it mean to be separated from the world? The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world and the lust thereof shall pass away, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. I remember preaching sermons on that and hearing sermons on that years ago. Separated from the sins of the world, having our own lifestyle, having our own Christian culture. Where is it? We somehow think we can hold hands with the world and make it to heaven. We somehow think we can have our one foot in the world and one foot in heaven and we're going to make it. We won't. So there's repentance, there's faith, and there's obedience. Following Christ, even to the death. He said, even to the death of the cross. Are you willing to do that? Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Every day, newspapers, radio, and television tell us of demonstrations and marches and protests and bombings, all of which are designed to gain some sort of freedom. A little baby, for example, may scream and cry and wave its arms and legs trying to be free, but without restraint and care, it would soon be dead. I read about a baby. I think it was locked in a car. I don't know whether it was here in Sacramento. It was here in California in all this heat. And the mother went into the store, and she was only gone a few minutes, and she came back, and the little baby had suffocated. Baby needs care. A teenager rejects his parents in search of freedom and soon finds himself dependent on some drug or on some gang. Thousands of laws indicate that we do not have total freedom. Jesus said he would give you total freedom, spiritual and moral freedom, and ultimately freedom from the very presence of sin when we get to heaven. Pope John Paul gave a message last week in Austria on the prodigal son. And we have just made a, a motion picture, by the way, on the prodigal that's being released just about now throughout the country. And I hope you'll see it. It's the best picture we've ever made. And we've been making them for 30 years. But the history of mankind, he said, is the history of the misuse of freedom. The history of mankind is the misuse of freedom. Jesus will teach us how to use our freedoms for the glory of God. 
and will bring fulfillment in our lives. Before you come to Christ, you're a slave of sin. No other truth can free you. Scientific truth can't free you. Mathematical truth or philosophical truth will not free you. Suicide will not free you. That only kills the body. It doesn't kill the spirit of the soul. Zacchaeus was freed by Christ from greed and Mary Magdalene from lust and Peter was freed from his cowardice. Christ's truth makes you free. Free from the penalty of sin. You'll never have to go to hell. You'll never face the judgment. Freedom someday from the presence of sin. Freedom from the power of sin now. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you from right now on if you've come to Christ. Right now, the devil snaps the whip. You obey. You're his slave. You don't think you are, but you are. You can be free right now by coming to Christ and letting him change you. I'm going to ask you tonight to do something we have already seen hundreds of people do in this crusade. And we've seen thousands on every continent. Oriental people, black people in Africa, Europeans, Latin American people in every country in Latin America except Bolivia, where we've held crusades. We've seen them do this same thing. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform as a symbol, a symbolic act, in which you are saying, I do repent the best I know how with God's help. I do receive him. I will follow him and obey him. Or maybe you're coming because you would like to be sure. We had a bishop come forward one night in a city not too long ago, and he said, I came forward because I wanted to make sure of my relationship with Christ. You may be a leader in the church, but you're not sure that your sin is forgiven, that you're going to heaven, or that you are free. The kind of freedom that Christ is talking about. He's the truth that can set you free. And after you've all come and stood here, we're going to have a prayer, and I'm going to say a word to you and then give you some literature, and you can go back to your friends. If you're with friends and relatives, they'll wait on you. If you come from that top stand up there, it'll take you almost two minutes, so start now. Hundreds of you come from everywhere, from the back, from the front. And after you've come, we'll have our prayer, give you your literature, and you can go back and join your friends. But get up and come. If there's a doubt in your heart tonight that you're ready to meet God, you come. And make sure that your sins are forgiven, that you're going to heaven. Quickly, get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds of people are responding here tonight, you can call the number on your screen where people are standing by ready to talk to you to help you with your spiritual needs and problems. Write the number down. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again. You that have been watching by television, there's a telephone number there that you can call and find help by talking to a counselor that's standing by waiting to talk to you about some of these things that I've talked about tonight, about your relationship to Christ. Make that call, and if it's busy, keep trying. May God help you to make that commitment tonight, and may God bless you, and be sure, and go to church next Sunday.
If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross and when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem and they made each one of them bear a placard or at least a herald went before them to bear a placard telling of their crimes. And then Jesus stumbled and fell. He was weak from the loss of blood and they compelled an African to help him carry his cross. And as long as the history of man shall go, we will always remember that it was an African that helped Jesus bear his cross. There are people today that say that Christianity is the white man's religion. Don't you believe it? For all of those who believe in Jesus Christ he belongs to all people. He came from that part of the world that touches Asia, Africa, and Europe. He belongs as much to the African as he does to the European, and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in. These two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? 
those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross, and it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven. And the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sin and your sin. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died, and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him. But one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we are dying justly. We deserve to be crucified, but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief, a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the books, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me 
He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment, and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison knew that he was going to die on a cross. He knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good works. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he'd ever committed, wiped the slate clean, and he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Or you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. 
What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine, the earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together. And if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them. God remembers them. And God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. Because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you die. It's all there. It's all in the record book, and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. The scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sins. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. 
He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, he that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now and come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say, I want Christ in my life. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day. I want my life transformed by the power of Christ. I'm going to ask you to come right now, men, women, young people. God has spoken to you. You need Christ. And in a moment like this, you'll never forget it. I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ and said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. Now, I want to say a word to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven you want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sin and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past. And from tonight on, there are four things that are very important. First, read your Bible every day. We're going to give you a Gospel of John. We want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the Bible. We're going to give you a Bible study. We're going to give you some verses of Scripture to learn, memorize. This helps you to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby, the Scripture says. You cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the Scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're His child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayer. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer. And pray about everything, whatever the details are. Nothing is too small to bring to God's attention. And then thirdly, witness for Christ. How do you witness? You witness by the smile on your face. You witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory, the new attitude you have toward work, the new attitude you have in the home. And then you witness by going to somebody of another race 
and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be. But he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.